we are going to go over part C of the January 2023 chemistry exam. This is the last part of the exam. You got 20 questions. They're all going to be uh, short answer type questions. Some are going to be calculations. Some are going to be ex explanations. This is as important as any other part of the exam. You want to really do well on that multiple choice and then hopefully pick up the points you need here with part C and B-2. B-2 is also short answer type questions. Make sure you're going over all the four different parts of the exam. Come back, do some more practice. You can check out the entire exam on New York State's Regents Chemistry site. Practice, practice, practice. Come back for the answers explained and tips as far as taking the exam. And that's enough rambling. Let's get started. Here we are. We have a few questions. It's going to be 66 through 68. So three questions where the information above these three questions may or may not be important. You want to read everything and then go to the question. In 66, it says, explain why the formula for tetraboric acid is an empirical formula. Well, it's going to be easy to explain why if you remember what an empirical formula is. That's your lowest whole number ratio of atoms in the formula. And if you take a look at tetraboric acid, I can't divide by a common denominator and not end up with a decimal or a fraction really saying the definition of an empirical formula as the answer for 66. Let's go to 67. Determine the number of moles of boric acid. This is boric acid that react in the equation to produce 10 moles of water. Let me go ahead and erase this and let's take a look at the balanced equation. This is what I call a mole mole problem. Equation is already balanced for you. And what do we have? We have four moles of boric acid will yield five moles of water. Well, guess what? We don't have five, we have 10. And really all we have here is a proportion. It's 10, and I always tell my students five for the coefficient underneath, and x over four. So literally, again, it's x over 4 is equal to 10 over 5. Well, I cross multiply. I got 40 is equal to 5x. And then I go ahead and I divide. And my answer is 8. Some students recognize the fact that it's a 4 to 5 ratio and 10 is double 5. So it has to be double of 4, which again is 8. Otherwise, set up a proportion, and go ahead and calculate your answer. The last question in this set, 68, show a numerical setup. Now, for a numerical setup, that means we're going to show how to calculate it, but we're not actually calculating the answer. We're calculating the mass in grams of a 0.2 mole sample of borax. All right, so borax, we're going to go into the reading, and we're told borax, and here's the formula, is a hydrate with a gram formula mass of 381 grams per mole. So they gave us the gram formula mass. Well, we're looking for mass. We have moles and gram formula mass. Reference table T, moles is equal to mass divided by gram formula mass. That's the equation. As far as the numerical setup, it's 0.200. And that's moles is equal to, I can put x for my mass, and 381 in the denominator for my grams per mole. That's all you have to do for 68. All right, we're checking out 69 through 71. Hold that up here. And we have a laboratory setup. We're burning a candle. You'll notice we have a can with water. And we're looking for the heat combustion of candle wax. And there's a lot of information here as well that you would want to read through. Not to mention a fact, the fact that you're given a data table. You got a picture, you got a paragraph to read, and a data table. For 69, it says state the number of significant figures used to express the value for the mass of the water in the can. Well, if I look at the table, the mass of water in the can, it's 190 with a decimal point. 
Real simple, when you have a number greater than one and a decimal point, you count them all. That's the one, the nine, and the zero. That would be three significant figures. For question 70, it says state the direction of heat flow between the air and the water in the can before the candle is lit. Well, we know that heat flows from hot to cold, but we're going to have to go back and read a little bit more about the passage to figure this out. We're looking at what's going on as far as heat flow between the air and the water in the can. So I'm going to put air and water. Again, always flows from hot to cold. All right. The third sentence here, the starting temperature of the water is 5 degrees Celsius and the air temperature in the room is 22 degrees Celsius. That tells me then the air is a higher temperature, more energy than the water. So it's going to flow from the air to the water. That's the answer. And finally, in question 71, we want to determine the amount of heat absorbed by the water. We have to be careful here, right? We're talking about the heat absorbed by the water. Usually what we're going to do is we're going to use the calorimetry equation of Q is equal to M C delta T. The M would be the mass of the water. The C would be the specific heat capacity for water as a liquid, which is on the front of the reference tables. And delta T would be the change in the temperature of the water. And if we take a look, we have the mass of the water in the can, and we have the temperature change of the water. And let's go to the reference table. I'll show you where to find the specific heat capacity. Here it is, reference table B, the specific heat capacity for water as 4.18. I plugged in all the values. Use a calculator here, please. And just reading it off the calculator, we have 30,974 joules. Now you could round it to 31,000 or 30,000. Well, 31,000, yeah, would be if you wanted to round it to two sig figs. Um, you'll notice also in the problem, you got the heat of combustion of the wax and the mass of the wax. We didn't normally go over this as a standard calculation. But if you're good with units and numbers, you can pretty much figure out that this would be for the candle, right? And the energy lost by the candle should have been put into the water. So if we just take 37,000 and multiply by 0.83, which was the mass of the candle that burned, we should get the same value, assuming we didn't lose anything to the surroundings. And we pretty much get, yeah, we get 31,000. All right, you only have to do the one calculation. Q is equal to MC delta T is the one that's on reference table T and the one that students are going to be familiar with. In a way, this is here almost to confuse you and detract you. Don't let that happen. All right, remember that the energy that's lost is equal to the energy that's gained by something else. So in this case, the energy that was lost by the wax was gained by the water. Now in 72 through 76, we're checking out this system at equilibrium. We're told it's at equilibrium. We also see the double arrows. And in 72, state the evidence from the equation that the forward reaction is exothermic. We know that the forward reaction, meaning going from left to right, is exothermic because energy is a product, right? Or it's on the right-hand side. For 73, compare the rate of the forward reaction to the rate of the reverse. That is what's equal in equilibrium. They are equal. That shows up every year on the chemistry regents exam. In this case, it's a short answer. A lot of times it shows up as a multiple choice. Don't forget equal rates. For 74, it says on the labeled axes in your answer booklet, draw a potential energy diagram for the forward reaction represented in this equation. Well, we're not going to do the answer booklet. I'm going to just go ahead and change the color here. I'm going to put an axis here. Now, the forward, remember, is exothermic. So that means we start with a higher energy, we end with a lower. The main thing is don't forget that there's always activation energy. So there's always going to be that kind of rise or little hill, if you will, in the middle of the potential energy diagram. That's it for 74. For 75, state in terms of moles of gases, 
why the equilibrium shifts to the right due to an increase in pressure. Again, with 75 in terms of moles of gas. Let's take a look at that first. I have one in front of nitrogen for the balanced equation, one plus three for the hydrogen. I have a total of four moles of gas on the left. I have a two in front of ammonia, which is a gas, and two moles on the right. The equilibrium is shifting to the right because when I increase pressure, the shift is towards the least number of moles of gas. And that is your answer. For 76, state what happens to the rate of the forward reaction when iron is added to the system. If we take a look at the little reading here, we're told iron can be used as a catalyst. And what do catalysts do? They speed up the reaction. They're only asking you about the forward reaction. All right, so the rate of the forward reaction is going to speed up. Checking out 77 through 79. Reading passage, equation 77. Identify the element present in urea that is present in all organic compounds. What makes organic compounds organic is the element carbon. It's a fact, Jack. Shows up a lot on the test. Don't forget that. For 78, it says compare the formula mass of the two compounds in the equation. Remember, a formula mass just means the units are in AMUs, atomic mass units, instead of gram formula mass, where it's grams per mole. And you see, I have two lists here. What I've done is I've just wrote down the different elements that appear in both of these formulas, and we're going to just compare the number of the different atoms of the elements. For ammonium cyanate, we have two nitrogens, one on either end of the formula, four hydrogens, we have one oxygen and one carbon. For urea, we have again two nitrogens. For hydrogen, we have two plus two is four. For oxygen, we have one oxygen and we have one carbon. Well, look at that. The atoms of the different elements are exactly the same. If we multiplied them by the masses on the periodic table and added them up, they would be exactly equal. So they are the same for 78. For 79, it says in state in terms of molecular polarity, why urea is very soluble in water. Well, you want to remember, water is a polar molecule. That must mean urea is also a polar molecule like dissolves like. We are close to the end here. We have two questions, 80 and 81, that have to do with a voltaic cell. You've studied this with electrochemistry. I'm going to go ahead and keep going down. We're given a graph regarding the voltages, and let's check out the two questions. For question 80, it says, based on the graph, determine the voltage of the cell if the copper to nitrate concentration is 1.5 molar. Well, and literally when you take the test, and also with the reference tables, mark up the reference tables and your test. It's for you to use. Nobody else is going to use it. I'm at 1.5. I go up, and then I'm going to go over to where it hits the y-axis. It looks to be pretty much right in the middle, so I would say it's going to be 1.105. Alrighty, for the voltage for 80. And for 81, it says write a balanced half reaction equation for the oxidation of zinc that occurs in this cell. You're given the overall redox equations without the um, spectator ions, and you can pull down what's going on with zinc. Now, oxidation, Leo, loss of electrons. I have zinc, and it's going to zinc ions, so it's going from an oxidation number of zero it's a solid here, plus two. And what does that mean? That the zinc atoms have lost two electrons. And there's your half reaction. This is it. We're looking at 82 through 85. A lot of times they do leave nuclear questions to the end. And then this is no exception for January. In 82, it says state the neutron proton ratio for the, an atom of iron 58 in equation one, all right? So the number of neutrons, in order to get the number of neutrons, I'm gonna take this mass number, 
58, and I'm going to subtract the atomic number, which is 26. Use a calculator. 8 minus 6 is 2, and 5 minus 2 is 3. So the number of neutrons is 32, and the number of protons is 26, right? The number of protons is your atomic number and your nuclear charge. For 83, it says state in terms of elements. Y equation 2 represents a transmutation reaction. Well, let me erase this. In terms of elements now, remember, this is always important. It's transmutation because we have iron 59 that is being transformed into cobalt 59. All right, so that's transmutation. In 84, identify the particle X that is represented in equation three. When I balance nuclear equations, it couldn't be simpler. I'm going to add the mass numbers on either side. They have to be equal, and the atomic numbers have to be equal. So 59 plus what number equals 60? And of course, we know that's a 1. I'm just going to write it here for my x. And then, and then what do I have? I have 27 plus x is equal to 27. Well, obviously, the bottom number has to be 0. All right, so what has a mass of one but an atomic number of zero well let's head to the reference tables i want to show you something table o is probably one of the most underutilized tables again we have a mass number of one atomic number of zero we're going to play the matching game take a look don't guess even if you think you're sure take a look at reference table o and here it is it is a neutron all right we are up to 85 Again, typical question that's asked, a half-life question. For 85, it says, determine the fraction of the original sample of cobalt-60 that remains unchanged after 15.813 years. Well, what we were not given up here was the half-life for cobalt-60. Yep, you guessed it. We got to go to the reference tables. Reference table N. As your half lives cobalt 60 is the 5.271 years. We're going to need that. All right. What I like to do with my students is a uh, chart. And since we're dealing with fractions, I'm going to start with a mass of 1 and time is 0. One half life goes by, which is 5.271 years. And now I have half of the whole. I have a half. Another 5.2 seven one years goes by and i'm going to have a half of a half which is a quarter now i got to go to 15.813 years that's going to be one more half life a uh, half of a quarter right is an eighth and that's going to get me to my 15.813 years and there's my answer one eighth so as we're moving forward in time, you have the mass with each half-life. And what do you do with time? You add time. So that ends Part C of the January 2023 Regents exam. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below. Hopefully you made it through. Hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe. I keep doing YouTube shorts, trying to get everything I can out there to make it successful for all students when it comes to doing the chemistry regents and anything else regarding chemistry and problem solving. As always, have fun and good luck.